You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. Cthulhu Lives continues today with a mythos story by the British writer Simon Bleakin. The Flower Dancer tells of a troubling encounter with a strange woman and her cohorts in a crumbling, unfamiliar backwater. See the video description for author info, as well as a link to the series playlist. And without further ado, The Flower Dancer, by Simon Bleakin. I used to love those long drives we took out into the countryside in summer. They felt like the closest we truly got to freedom. The sun beating down, glinting off of the sides of our red two-door Pontiac Tempest. The windows wound down, and the wind rippling through our hair, while the birds sang about Mr. Tambourine Man, or the holy modal rounders treated us to a blast of their psychedelic hesitation blues. The sun was out, and the day was warm. We had blown off our college classes and had the whole day ahead of us, not to mention a small stash of reefer in the glove compartment. It was the kind of day when it was hard to hold a dark thought in your mind, and a worry in your heart. Well, almost— in truth, we both knew that freedom was just an illusion. He slipped his hand into mine, and I closed my fingers around it, wanting desperately to hold him and press my lips against the soft skin of his neck and face, to feel his agile body against mine. Instead, a discreet handhold was all we allowed ourselves, at least out here where people might see. Outside of our homes, we were simply friends. We had to be— because in 1968 the world wouldn't allow us, two men in love, to be anything else. Fancy skinny dipping in the lake, Ricky? I asked, moving my hand onto his leg. It's warm enough, he grinned, knowing full well I just wanted to get him naked and stoned someplace secluded. But I've got something else in mind today. We can go to the lake next Saturday, if you like. Catch some rays, have a little fun. That'd be boss, but— I frowned. Aren't you coming to the protest next weekend? I can't, Scott. Why not? Come on, I urged. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today, remember? He had gone suddenly silent on me, and I could tell by the set of his jaw that he was uneasy. I'd seen that look enough times to know what it meant. Don't tell me you dig this stupid war. Course not, but he tailed off, shaking his head. You really like your country supporting a corrupt dictatorship in Saigon? You know innocent people are dying out there, right? I know, but— So we have to speak out. Hey, he said, cutting me off. Chill, Scott. Why has everything got to be a debate with you? I held my hands up in a gesture of surrender, and he sighed and shook his head. Look, it's not that simple, okay? He didn't have to say any more. We both knew the reason he was hesitating was because of his old man. He had connections in politics and was a prominent businessman to boot, not someone you wanted to hack off through a scandal or by openly showing defiance to authority. Especially, I thought sourly, when he gives you wheels for your birthday. Who wanted to risk losing those kind of perks? I could sense an argument brewing, and I didn't want to let a fight spoil the day and ruin our time together. So I dropped the matter and turned my attention to watching the world roll by. It was then that I realized I had no idea where we were. The road had become smaller, while the land around us had grown hillier and rugged, the colors of the vegetation darker and more muted. There was an immediate sense of bleak isolation that was almost palpable. It felt as if we could be a hundred miles from anyone else— the hills were crested with gnarled clumps of leafless trees. Large pools of stagnant water had gathered at the roadside in long stretches, buzzing with insects and smelling like rotting meat. Where are we going? You'll see, 
Ricky nodded, flashing me a cryptic smile. For once I was in no mood for one of his mystery tours. There was something about this place that was unsettling, though I couldn't put my finger on any one obvious source. Please just tell me, I said quietly. Okay, geez. He shook his head. Gonna head up to Hope's Point. It's supposed to be romantic and private, plenty of places to be alone. I heard there's a good view up there, too. You've not been before? No, but some guys back at Chrissy's said it's a good spot. I sat back, unconvinced, but not wanting to fight any more. I knew the kind of cats that hung out at Chrissy's diner, and I could imagine what they might consider a good spot. But I didn't want another argument, so I kept my mouth shut and listened to the music, and tried not to look too closely at the clusters of gently swaying gnarled trees that crested those hills. The road became narrower and more winding as we went. The air around us was definitely getting warmer, and even with the windows wound down, I could feel the sweat running down my body. Eventually, the road rose and the hill slipped away. We came upon a large, flat expanse of green farmland, a few houses and a ruined church dotting the horizon. Ricky pulled over as we drew up next to a small sign. It was battered and rusting, hanging sideways from a single nail. Witchstone? He frowned as he read it. That doesn't sound right. Did you take a wrong turn? I must have. Let's head back. Still time to go to the lake, I prompted, keen to get away from this place and back to familiar territory. He was still staring at the sign, brow furrowed, drumming his fingers on the wheel as he chewed his lower lip thoughtfully. You ever heard of Witchstone? No, but I never come out this way much. Don't have wheels like you do. I don't see how I missed the turning. You must have if this isn't it. All right, let's go. He sighed, giving that sign one last bewildered look. Without warning, the car lurched and shuddered, the engine spluttering and whimpering before cutting out. Ricky turned the key, but the engine only wheezed. Son of a bitch! He thumped the dashboard with the palm of his hand. We climbed out of the car, which was starting to feel more like an oven in the hot day. I watched the horizon anxiously as Ricky checked the engine. The farmhouses and buildings in the distance should have provided a sense of comfort, the first sign of civilization for a good long while, but they didn't. I realized I was holding my breath and allowed myself to exhale, before glancing at Ricky, who was still peering in at the engine. Normally, the sight of his sexy ass in his bell-bottom jeans would have done something for me, but today I barely registered it. What I did register was the sound of a woman humming. Turning, I realized there were people out in one of the fields to our right. I could see a young woman dancing in the middle of a circle of seated figures, topless men and women, who had their eyes closed and their hands linked. The dancing woman had dark purple flowers braided in her long hair, which spilled down around her shoulders. She was wearing a loose-fitting, tie-dyed t-shirt, mud-stained flared jeans, and sandals. A mauve scarf was tied around her waist like a belt, with more of the flowers threaded into it. Her eyes were closed, her arms spread wide, as she moved slowly and rhythmically in a circle, while the seated figure swayed in time to her humming. I stood watching them for a moment, while Ricky wrestled with the engine. "'There's something all clogged up in here,' he cursed. "'Looks like grass or plants.' "'Hey, check out the flower children,' I said, nudging him with my elbow, before realizing the woman had stopped her dance and was looking back at me. "'Car trouble?' she called over, the seated figures around her stirring and turning in our direction." Giving me a grin and a busted look, Ricky stood and wiped his greasy hands on his jeans. "'She won't start,' he called back. "'Is there a phone around here? Or a garage?' The woman smiled and gestured for us to come over. I waited for Ricky to close the hood and lock the car before we climbed the fence skirting the field and walked over to join them. With each step the air seemed to get hotter— 
I could feel sweat running down my face and body, and the cloth under my armpits and down my back was sodden. My! She laughed as we reached the edge of the circle of seated figures, who were all watching us, though none of them had moved. You should get those shirts off. You must be boiling. It is a hell of a day, Ricky agreed. But we just want to find a phone or a mechanic, if you could help. Of course, she nodded. I'm near, by the way. Ricky, and this is Scott. You look lost. We don't get many folk out this way any more. We're trying to get to Hope's Point. Mm, think we took a wrong turn. That you have, she said sweetly, giving Ricky an appraising look. The kind I'd seen women give him a lot, usually right before a look of confusion or offence when the interest wasn't returned. But not to fret. We'll get you all fixed up. We'd sure appreciate it. I lowered my head to wipe my eyes. In the heat haze of the day, the sweat kept running into them, and froze, all thoughts of comfort forgotten. Nia's hands were resting down by her sides, but the nails seemed to be blackening and curling up at the ends. As long as we're not disturbing your... gathering, Ricky gestured at the others. It's just a little celebration, she explained, as her nails lengthened like warped needles and the skin on her fingers turned coarse and blotchy, to honour the land and the sea and all that sleeps under them, and to praise the hallowed spaces between the worlds where our other masters walk. I stared at those freakish nails, unable to blink, unable to breathe, wondering how this could possibly be real. Surely it was a trick of the light, or a side effect of the unbearable heat that must be baking my brain, as it was my body. Then I noticed something shift in the grass by her feet, as a shadowy tendril coiled up around her ankle. I grabbed Ricky's arm, shooting him a terrified glance, but when I looked back, her nails and ankles seemed perfectly normal once more. "'Everything all right?' Nia asked, her smile playful, and her attention was now on me. "'You're a bit jumpy.' "'I'm just uh, really hot,' I said, forcing the words out through a throat that felt constricted. I was aware that Ricky was staring at me as if I'd grown a second head, and I knew he hadn't seen any of it. Nia's gaze remained fixed intently on me, and though her mouth was smiling, there was a coldness and hostility about her eyes that had not been there before. It was then that I realized it hadn't been my imagination. "'Yeah, it's sweltering today,' <laughs> Nia laughed. "'Why not come sit with us for a bit? It's cool in the grass. We should go back to the car.' I tugged on Ricky's arm. "'Car's busted, man.' Ricky said. You want a walk or something? Long walk to Hope's Point from here, Nia chipped in. My pa can sort your car out, and for less than what any garage will charge. Ah, oh, man, that'd be boss, Ricky said. I can settle any debt. The grass around Nia's feet rippled again, though the air was still. Something dark flashed quickly past her leg, rising up above the level of those shimmering green blades for a second but not long enough for me to see what it was. I had already started backing away. My stomach was crawling with unease, and a tight knot had formed in my throat, cutting off all but a choked gasp. Beside us, the circle of men and women rose up as one, turning to face us. A sense of sudden danger seized me. "'There are other ways you can pay us, of course,' Nia explained sweetly. "'If we help you,' Perhaps you'd be willing to help us in return. The grass around her feet rippled again, and this time I thought I heard a sound accompanying it, like whispering voices. Dark purple flowers rose from the grass, like cobras lifting their heads to strike. Sure, I guess, Ricky agreed. He had just noticed that the group of people had risen and was moving closer, and I saw his brow furrow in confusion. He hadn't realized the danger yet, but I had. I grabbed his arm and started to run, trying to pull him with me. Something cold and clammy coiled around my foot, and I fell, landing face down into the grass. 
I scrambled to my feet as quickly as I could, and turned to look for Ricky. That was when someone grabbed me from behind, pinning my arms behind my back. I squirmed and kicked, but the hands that held me were like iron clamps. I gritted my teeth against the pain. It felt as if my arms were being wrenched out of their sockets. The rest of the group was holding Ricky down, pinning his limbs against the grass as thick black vines bristling with sharp thorns coiled up from the ground below. He pleaded as they wrapped around his neck before slithering onto his face, pricking and slicing the skin. He bucked and thrashed violently, arms and legs fighting against the grip of the people holding him down, while the tendons in his neck stuck out like steel cables. I wanted to help him. My heart felt as if it would burst as I watched, but I was equally powerless to move. I could only stare in numb horror— as those tendrils pulled at his lips, splitting the skin as they forced them apart. Their flexing tips secreted three drops of an oily brown liquid into his mouth. He went limp at once, his body collapsing to the ground like a lifeless puppet. His eyes rolled back in the sockets, exposing the whites. I thought he was dead, until I noticed the soft rise and fall of his chest. Then the other surrounded him, and I lost sight of him. I realized Nia was watching me, a smile cold. A surge of dread shot through me when I saw her eyes, black as pitch and without any whites. Come, Scott, she said softly. Taste of the nectar and be reborn. With a howl of terrified grief, I drove my head back and felt it smash into the nose of the man holding me. There was a sharp crack. Blood spattered onto my neck as he released me. I started running, not caring where, ignoring the pain in my skull and my arms, just wanting to get away from those people and those unnatural plants. All I could think about was Ricky, how I was abandoning him to who knew what fate. I had no choice. I couldn't get close to him with those people around him. I couldn't help him if I let them do the same to me. I expected to hear the sounds of the group giving chase. Instead, it was as if a bizarre calm had settled on everything. All I could hear was the blood pumping through my veins. I ran without looking back until my heels stung and a stitch burned in my side. I faltered and stumbled as the pain got worse, but up ahead I saw the outline of the ruined church I had spotted earlier a blackened wooden shell sitting atop a stone basement. Half of one end of the upper structure was gone, the charred timbers revealing its fate all too clearly, but the remaining beams had fallen in such a way that the rest of it looked like an inviting place to take refuge. I levered a few of them up, and crawled inside. I scurried as far back into the surviving section as I could, feeling the cold stone underneath me mercifully cool against my sweat-soaked body. I found a shady corner, and wedged myself in behind an overturned pew. I waited, my heart pounding, and my body shivering as I listened fearfully to the silence outside. It was all too still, too quiet. Had I been followed? Had they seen where I had gone? I had no way of knowing— and the waiting was more agonizing than the run to get there. I forced my trembling body to move once more, my arms protesting painfully, and searched my immediate area for something to use as a weapon. I found a sizable length of wood with two rusted nails jutting from the end of it that felt solid enough to do some damage. It was then that I spotted a trapdoor set into the stone floor that must have led down to the cellar of the church. I cleared away as much of the dirt and debris as I could, wondering if this might make a more secure place to hide. "'You really have nowhere to go, you know,' Nia's voice called sweetly from outside. "'Do you honestly think charred wood and stone can offer protection?' I tensed, my eyes widening as I held my breath. "'Even if it did,' she laughed. "'How long can you stay in there without food or water?' As quietly as I could, I grasped the old metal ring of the trapdoor to the cellar, and lifted it slowly. 
"'You don't know what you're missing,' she said, and something heavy slid against the outside wall of the church close to my head. I saw the timbers flex and shake as dirt sifted down onto me. The gifts we have here are beyond words, and we're willing to share them with you. The iron ring screamed as it turned. I cursed under my breath. The strange sound from outside came again, like something slithering, slapping, thumping against the charred boards of the ruined church. I wondered if those weakened timbers would hold. You can hear them in your dreams, Nia continued. They call to us. They want us to remember them. I gingerly prized the old cellar door open. It lifted awkwardly, then stuck. I feared trying to force it further, lest it bring the rest of the ruins down on top of me. I squeezed into the narrow gap and down onto the wooden steps into the gloom below. The cellar was cold and dark and musty. Cobwebs hung in thick swathes from the ceiling, and strange shapes covered in mouldering dust sheets loomed out of the shadows. Narrow, grime-encrusted windows encircled the space. I could see Nia's feet as she walked around outside. I ducked down to stay out of sight as I worked my way through the cellar, looking for a better weapon, a way out, anything that might help me. At least she seemed to be alone out there. They're in the flowers here, she whispered, suddenly pressing her face against the very window I had been looking out of. Everything is connected, and the flowers here sprout up from deep down in the soil where some of them lie. They carry their memory with them, especially here. Who? I called back at last, hoping to keep her talking and distracted, while I searched under the dust sheets one by one. The first contained only rotting Christmas decorations and a box of old Bibles. The old ones, who came to this world from the stars and the spaces between reality, singing songs of madness and fire. Those who whisper in dreams and sing to the faithful, and the other ones, the gods who walk in certain places and leave their mark upon the land in other ways. We gather here in awe of their power and to listen to their songs. The pastor told us we had been tempted by Satan. He wanted us to pray with him. But he screamed and burned, took half his church with him when we set him on fire. His God never came to his aid. He didn't know what we did. Different gods walk here. Why here? I called, squeezing past an old pile of chairs, as I made my way into the deepest part of the cellar. It was darker there, and it took my eyes a moment to adjust to the gloom. I accidentally bumped a table as I went, and sent a box of light bulbs smashing on the floor. This is one of the special places. This place knows her touch. She walks here some nights when the moon is full, and Certain constellations show. All that grows here is blessed by her presence. Come and dance in the garden of the black goat. Feel the pulse of her womb as she births, kills and blesses the land. Life and death are one with her. Your lover is tasting of her deep mysteries even now. You will have a place in her congregation with us, if you'll come. I could make out something in the corner of the basement now just visible in the deeper darkness. It looked like some kind of old tree trunk, about four feet across, with thick roots coiling away from it. Judging from the earth piled up on either side of it, it appeared to have burst up from the ground underneath the church. I darted toward it, wondering if perhaps it had broken a hole in the basement wall that I might slip out through. All I cared about was finding Ricky and getting away— I just hoped he would be all right. What had they done to him? As I drew nearer to that indistinct shape, a stench hit my nostrils, like blood and rot. I gagged. Do you like it? She laughed sweetly, her voice coming through the wall from outside. Sometimes she gives us the gift of a child. It was then that I understood why they hadn't pursued me inside the church. 
They had wanted me to go inside and find my way down here. They had wanted me to see this. With a shriek, the mass shifted. The sides of what I had mistakenly thought to be a tree trunk began undulating. The once still roots and branches writhed and flexed like serpents. The shape seemed to be pulling itself up and out of the earth, clods of dirt and showers of dry soil raining down from it. On the side of the bulk, two roomy white eyes appeared, and a vast slit of a mouth yawned open with a rush of stinking breath. A coiling mass of glistening tendrils and roots erupted out of it, slithering across the floor like a throng of writhing snakes. A foul soup of semi-digested organic slime vomited out along with them. I staggered back, my feet skidding in the putrid sludge that now covered them, a scream locked in my throat, unable to escape as I struggled to breathe. My world was spinning. All logical reasoning had collapsed before a pure animal instinct to turn and run. That was my sole thought. I staggered back through the basement, overturning tables and sending boxes flying in my haste, all the while aware of the thrashing that signaled that the terrible thing was waking behind me in the darkness. I could hear those vile tendrils slithering across the floor, coiling around the fallen boxes and scurrying along just behind my fleeing feet. One of the tables next to me suddenly lifted and was hurled sideways against the wall. There was a horrible bleating wail from behind me, and something brushed the back of my foot. Then I was scrambling up the steps and forcing my way out through the trapdoor once more my makeshift weapon lost as I forced myself through the narrow gap and into the fresh air. There was a sudden sharp pain in my thigh as a rusty nail bit deep into my skin, tearing through the fabric of my cords. Somehow, I managed to avoid screaming and pushed myself off of the sharp metal. I let the door slam down upon whatever horror was below— I burst from the church and into the afternoon sun, gasping for breath, to find the entire structure encircled by a ring of people, many of them topless, one or two were totally nude, all of them were smiling and laughing. "'I told you stone and timber would offer you no protection,' Nia remarked, stepping forward from the circle of people. She was flanked by a large man in oil-stained coveralls, and a smaller elderly woman in a work-worn dress who had a series of large seeping boils covering her neck. But there is a place for you in our congregation still, if you want it. I looked around desperately, heart pounding as I tried to think of a way to escape. Then my eyes caught sight of Ricky standing amongst them. I felt as though a great invisible hand had slugged me in the gut— knocking both the wind and the fight out of me. He was grinning, holding hands with the others, his face slashed and bloodied from where the thorny tendrils had forced themselves against his skin. I started to cry and laugh at the same time. I sank to my knees, confusion and fatigue dragging me down, even as I stared hopelessly at the face of the man I loved. In that second, I knew I couldn't escape. I had already lost everything I wanted to fight for. Stand up, Nia said. She stood over me, a smile playing on her lips. Her eyes were black. I could see the green roots of the plants moving through her hair, like snakes slithering through long grass. I shook my head, knowing how futile refusal was. I felt arms hook under my shoulders and pull me up, as the man in the oil-stained coveralls lifted me to my feet. In a sudden burst of panic I turned, clawing at his face in an effort to make him let go. My fingers dug into his skin, and his face peeled away like melting wax. I saw the flexing mass of thorny roots that covered his skull like a fine mesh. I screamed and staggered back, straight into Ricky's arms. Don't fight this, baby, he whispered, his hands grabbing my arms tightly. I felt something die inside me then. 
The hands that once had been so familiar to me felt like the touch of a stranger. I searched his eyes, desperate to find something of the man I loved still inside them. There was nothing. With a maddened howl, I collapsed against him, calling out to a god I didn't believe in, to let me wake from this terrible nightmare. "'You're calling to the wrong god,' Nia said softly. "'And you have nothing to fear.' I opened my eyes and stared blankly at her, my body still shaking in Ricky's grasp. "'I was given a different honour from the others,' she whispered, kneeling in the grass and holding out her hands. I was given the task of spreading her word out amongst the people here. I draw in followers so that we can offer life and death to her when she wills it. Her messenger whispers to me, I feel his cold fingers in my skull, and I do as I am bid. From both sides of her, I saw something slipping through the grass, and realized it was two feral cats. Their fur was matted and missing in places. Large, weeping lesions and festering boils speckled their bodies. Their eyes were a sickly yellow hue. They paused beside her and licked her hands, and she looked up at me and smiled. And so will you. Ricky's hands clamped around my face as Nia moved lithely towards me, her fingernails once more twisted and warping into black needles. This will hurt, she assured me, but birth is never painless. I could see a brownish fluid weeping from the tips of those curving black talons, just like the nectar I had seen coming out of the plants, and I opened my mouth. To plead or to scream, I wasn't quite sure. Before I could, she lunged forward and jabbed those dark needle-like claws deep into the sides of my neck. In that instant, the world changed forever. The nectar surged through my veins, tingling in my fingers and toes, and causing the colors and textures of the world to come alive with a vibrancy I had never known or imagined before. Not even magic mushrooms or LSD had ever come close to it. I could hear the blood singing in my veins as it pumped around my body. I heard the whisper of the grass at my feet, a sea of voices singing the names of the forgotten ones that lay buried beneath the earth or sleeping beneath the icy waves of the oceans. It was as if a chorus of voices had awoken around me, singing of the forgotten masters and whispering dreadful secrets the likes of which I had never before imagined. I saw flashes of images that I couldn't begin to understand. Vast, weed-encrusted cities deep beneath the ocean floor, hewn from colossal blocks of ancient stone. Strange towers sitting alone in ageless deserts, surrounded by winged skeletons that even the sand refused to cover over. I saw inhuman shapes moving and pulsing around burning braziers, in the hearts of dense, verdant forests, while red-robed priests called and howled invocations through masks of bloody bone. I could feel the pulse of my heart beating in time with a pulse that I now sensed running through the land around me. I felt my heart quicken as my body swayed in time to the rhythm. I opened my eyes once more and saw that the circle of people was also moving in time to the same beat like a colossal heartbeat right beneath our feet. You hear and feel the life pulse of the mother, the black goat of the woods, Nier informed me. She has bestowed her blessing upon you, her love. Tears of joy were flowing down my face, and I tried to speak, but no words came out. She wants a gift in return, Nier smiled, and someone handed me an axe. Show your devotion to your mother. Feed the earth that moves to her pulse. I smiled as I took the axe. It was so beautiful, the light dancing and glinting on the blade, the feel of the wood grain against my skin. I turned to Ricky and saw the same glow of joy and wonder on his bloody but handsome face. I buried the axe in his head 
thrilling with delight as I heard his skull shatter, and saw the dazzling red spray that gushed out onto the grass. He slumped to the ground, and I planted my foot on his chest as I tore the axe free, barely aware that I was laughing. I remember vividly each subsequent blow of that axe, as it bit deep into his arms, legs, groin and torso, tearing through skin and cloth, severing bone with each strike. I felt a swell of pride as I stepped back and let the others tear apart what was left, clawing the pieces to shreds and scattering them over the fields and around the trees, feeding her plants with his lifeblood. As I watched them, I felt Nia slip her hand into mine. "'You have done well,' she whispered. "'It's funny. Looking back on what happened that day and how I felt then, I know now how foolish I had been to resist the gift I was offered, and what a blessing I was granted. The black goat's nectar opened my mind in a way that no drug ever could. I walk now with a sense of purpose and wonder to carry her voice deeper into the world. They never found Ricky's remains. The plants claimed them quickly and destroyed all the evidence. Ricky's red Pontiac is now resting securely at the bottom of a swamp, where it will never be discovered. It was Nia who drove me home, and who now stays close at my side, whispering and guiding, instructing me in the important task that lies ahead. Everyone at home seems to think I have finally found myself a ghoul, but there is no desire or love between us, only purpose, a deep and powerful calling. The only person I loved I gave in sacrifice to my new gods, for what greater sacrifice and show of devotion is there than to freely give up the thing you hold most dear? My path is clear now, to go back to college with a renewed enthusiasm, and work my way into politics. That is why she chose me, and that is why she gave me my new life. This world stands on a knife edge. Wars and atrocities happen every day, while people scream for peace and free love. It's an exciting time, ripe with new possibilities. It is time to shape that future, and bring the gospel of the black goat of the woods with a thousand young to the ears of all, so they can rejoice and sing and scream in her gifts of life and death. Ya, ya, Shabna Gurath. I hear her call, and will carry her voice out into the world. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.